Mark chapter 11. Today we're going to go back to the story that we're so familiar with, and yet it bears repeating. I couldn't get past one word this week, and we wanted to talk about that. That's the word Hosanna. In Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and said unto them, Go ye your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied whereunto never a man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do you do this? Say unto him, The Lord hath need of him, and straightway he'll send uh, him hither. And they went their way, and found the colt tied by the door without in a place, where two ways met. And they loosed him, a certain of them that stood there, said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto him, as Jesus had commanded, and they let him go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and cast their garments on him. And he sat upon him, and many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees, and strode them in the way. And they <clears throat> that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David. It cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I was reading this week. There was a legend from an old ancient village in Spain so many years ago. The villagers learned that the king was going to pay a visit to their little village. And it had been a thousand years since any king had visited this small uh, little cove, this little village. So excitement began to grow. We, grow. we, we must do something, uh, throw a big celebration, they said. Well, the villagers all agreed that that's exactly what they would do. But it was a poor village, very poor. And there weren't many resources among the people there. And someone came up with a classic idea. They said that every one of us will bring a glass, a cup of our best wine that we've produced in our fields and we'll all put it in a big vat. Everybody bring a glass. And when the vat is filled, when the king comes, we'll let him put uh, some of our wine in his glass. And he'll think it's the best wine that he's ever tasted. The day before the king arrived, hundreds of people lined up, made their offerings to honor their new guest. They climbed up the steps on this big barrel and they poured their glass into the barrel from the uh, from their farm, from their uh, uh, orchards. And finally, the vat was completely full. And the king arrived and he was escorted to the square. And there in the square, they gave him a silver cup. And he was told to draw out some wine from the big barrel and to taste it because it was the best that the villagers had. Well, he placed his cup under the spigot, turned the handle, and then he drank the wine that he had. But it was nothing more than just water. You see, every villager reasoned, well, I'll withhold my best wine, and I'll substitute water for what I bring. And with so many cups of wine in the vat, the king will never know the difference. The problem was that everybody else thought the same thing. So everybody had brought a glass of water instead of a cup of wine. And the king was totally dishonored. Now, that's a story like many Christians today. We all come together. We sing the praises of God. We talk about our Christian testimony and how much we love the Lord. But all we're doing is pouring water as an offering. Amen. We're not doing the things that would honor the Lord. You know, Palm Sunday is all about a day when the king, matter of fact, the king of kings, Amen. was greatly honored. Folks, people gave the very best that they had. They gave a gift of praise to the king of kings. And that day marked the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly life. If you think about it, on that Friday morning, Jesus was arrested on the, uh, and taken and hung on a cross. 
on uh, by that evening by he was on the uh, he was in a tomb on Friday night and all day Saturday he lay in that tomb and then ultimately on that Sunday morning he rose from the dead and we know it as Easter you see this is the story but it all began a week before where everybody in town lined the roads and said Hosanna Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The very next week, the same crowd would be saying, crucify him. But on that day, they praised him. Jesus had a mission. And his mission was to save. That was his whole reason for being here. He rode into Jerusalem that day on a mission. He was, it was the Passover season, you'll remember. And the greatest of all Jewish feasts in all the year. And people from all over Israel, every Jew would come to Jerusalem to the point that Jerusalem would be filled with almost three million people. That small city, filled for the Passover, to celebrate the holiday and commemorate the time when God's, God mightily freed the Jews from Egypt out of the bondage of Pharaoh under Moses. You remember the story? And Jesus already, having traveled and taught and performed miracles over the last three years, was making his way all the way to the holy city, knowing full well that this would be his last time. He knew what was going to happen. He knew how the people were going to treat him. He knew that he was going to die. But the Bible says Jesus knew that he must go to Jerusalem. He had a mission. What was the mission? Well, not too many days before this, he actually told us exactly what was to happen. He said in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was a statement of why he was here. Now, look at the word Hosanna again in the, in the scriptures that we read at the beginning. The word Hosanna literally means, in the original language, save. Save. Save, the crowd shouted. Save. In other words, they were looking for the Messiah to deliver them from the, 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 the uh, Roman Empire. They wanted Jesus to take them out of bondage and, and set them up as a nation. And rule as the king. And so they said, save, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. And they cried all along the way. Without knowing, Jesus said, that's exactly why I'm, what I'm here to do. He said it. I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's exactly why I'm here. But the unfortunate thing is, you say it, but you don't understand. I'm not saving you from the Roman Empire. I'm here to save your soul. Save you from an eternal hell. So as Jesus rode into town, the people let loose with a joyous, uninhibited praise. A crowd of people, probably made up mostly of those from Galilee, gathered and they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. But Jesus, by the time Jesus came along, Hosanna had become a very common shout among the Jewish people. Hosanna literally means to save. And so they would pray. And as they prayed, they would ask God to save. They would use the word Hosanna over and over again. The text says that the people were laying things down. As Jesus rode in, they laid things down before him. They laid their cloaks they laid branches from the trees that were in the field. And by spreading these on the road, as well as fresh cut branches from the trees, it's the same thing we do today when we roll out the red carpet in front of people as they make their way to the door. What a scene it must have been. Can you imagine that day? There were three million people in the city, all lined up, many of them shouting, Hosanna! And spreading things before the Lord. Now, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 19 and verse 40. He said, I tell you, they, uh, they were trying to get the Pharisees were telling Jesus to make everybody be quiet. They're making too much racket. It's going against the city fathers. Don't want racket in the streets. Jesus said, I tell you, 
that if, I, if they hold their peace, the stones will immediately cry out. God deserves praise, folks. And if people won't do it, God's creation will continue to do it. Continue to cry out. Think about it. Majestic mountains, mighty oceans, the expanse stars of the universe, the sun, the moon, the trees, the hills, the rocks would cry out if we don't do it. Can't keep the mouth shut. The one who also happened to ride into Jerusalem on an uh, inauspicious donkey to face the cruel death on the hands of sinful man came in and the people shouted and cried. Jesus said, I can't make them stop. If I try to make them stop, the rocks will cry out. Close your eyes for just a minute or just think with me for a second, would you? Let Use your... Use your sanctified imaginations. I want you to imagine the street that you live on. Look at your house. You can see it in your mind's eye. Picture in your mind what that street looks like. Picture in your mind where you live and where the trees are in your yard, uh, where you park your car, and the general amount of traffic that's typically going back and forth on the street where your house is located. I want you to imagine yourself standing outside next to the street that runs in front of your house and look at the things as people are coming and going. You have that picture? Well, now I want you to imagine that coming down that road in front of your house on the street that runs along uh, your, where your house is, where you live, you spot a crowd coming down the road. And in the middle of that crowd of the people, a man is riding a donkey. Can you see it on your street in front of your house? And some of your neighbors are rushing out from around the apartments or around the houses to just lay things down in the road as this man on a donkey is coming by. Jesus approaches. He looks where you're standing, riding closer. And as he passes by, what do you lay down? It's in front of your house. Everybody else is laying something down. What do you lay down? Here's a key question for you this morning. If Jesus came riding down your street, what would you lay before him? Think about it. What would you lay before him to praise his name? Remember, Jesus' mission is to save. What's your mission? What's our mission? If Jesus has come to save, then what are we supposed to do? Praise. Praise. To praise Jesus is essentially to give him a compliment. Give him a compliment. It can be done publicly. It can be done privately. It can be done in a variety of ways. You can do it by speaking a word or by a printed word or by words that are sung in the songs that we sing. It can be painted on signs that may outline the, the rooms that we're in in our Sunday school. Or any mode of communication or avenue can be a, a form of praise. It, uh, uh, it's what we're called on to do. You remember what Peter said as we studied First Peter? Peter said this, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light. Part of our mission, part of our reason for being here, whether you're 6 or 60 or 600, doesn't matter. The part of the reason that God has left you here is because he wants you to praise. Amen. Pay Jesus a compliment. Put a good word out for Jesus. Amen. Say good things about him and what he's done in your life. Tell, tell Jesus, thank you for something that he's done in your life. Make a joyful noise. That's your mission. So again, we ask ourselves the question. If Jesus came riding down your street, what would you lay down before him? To answer that best, we ought to consider that if there's anything standing in the way of our ability to praise, we need to get rid of it today. For example, as I sat in my office, I had to look at my own life 
And there are times when I could have said a word for the Lord and I didn't. And I'm sure you're the same. Maybe it's the matter of pride. Maybe pride is in the way of you casting something before the Lord and being grateful. We may, want to, we may not want to admit it, but perhaps pride stands in the way of our praising Jesus. I, I wonder if sometimes we overlook pride and just relate it to our temperament. Well, that's just my temperament. We say, well, by nature, I, I'm just not a very expressive person. My temperament doesn't lend itself to that kind of praise. Uh, and if it took place on the first Palm Sunday, I'm just too reserved to praise the Lord. I'll tell you someone who's not too reserved, and you may not remember it, a man by the name of Roberto Benigni. Roberto Benigni was an Italian guy who won an Oscar for the best actor a few years ago for the film Life is Beautiful. Now, I don't watch the Academy Awards. I'm not interested. But I read that upon hearing his name, Roberto Benigni, it took me a while to find out how to pronounce it. Roberto Benigni, he leaped to his feet. He threw his arms up in the air. He skipped across the tops of, of chairs and tables, and he bounded onto the stage. He squeezed Sophia Loren so tight that she, he nearly crushed her. And then he said, uh, uh, in a half English, half Italian kind of way, he said, this is a moment that's colossal, bring colossal joy, he said. And he kissed everybody. And he almost, he said, I'm dying in, 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 in an ocean of generosity, the way he put it. Well, this being the same man who at a later time hugged the Pope and kissed him so much that the Pope said, he said uh, uh, you're very Italian, aren't you? <laughs> Roberto Benigni, he would have fit right in with the crowd on Palm Sunday. He would have had no problem throwing down his coat or waving a branch from the tree. There's another guy who came along right after Roberto Benigni to receive an Oscar for a little known role. And he was a very tempered kind of a person. And as he stood behind the mic, uh, he said, uh, he said, uh, I thank you for it. And he said, inside, I feel like Robert, Roberto Benigni. In other words, he was withdrawn and he was kind of shy. He said, inside, I'm feeling like Roberto Benigni. And the audience just chuckled. They knew exactly what he was talking about. Now, that's temperament. He was shy. Bernini, uh, Bernini was not. The second man, the man who was shy, was as grateful as Roberto was, but he expressed it in a different kind of a way. Now, praise to Jesus can all be offered in many kinds of ways. Just as sincere by somebody who raises their hands and shouts and says amen as the person who bows their head in respect and in their heart says thank you. Amen. You don't have to jump up and down and roll down the aisle. You don't have to raise your hand. On our, on our recordings, you hear many of you saying amen. You don't have to shout and, and make a, a fuss. You can just bow your head and thank the Lord. But we need to praise. So how might we sometimes confuse temperament with pride? When we don't engage in praise, when we have the opportunity to praise, we just shrug it off as our temperament. We just, we just don't think about being gra grateful. Or we, we're just being reserved. We're just kidding ourselves. Whether you shout, hold your hands up or not, the fact is that every one of us have a way of being grateful to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I noticed over the past 50 years in churches, I started out as a music director, youth pastor, but I've noticed over the years that so many times in churches that I've pastored, that I've held meetings in, that men, some men, don't sing. They don't sing. They just stand there. And you know, I look at them and I look over at their son and their sons don't sing either. They've taught their son. Exactly when in my last church, I had a hard time getting my deacons to say amen. I bought them t-shirts that said, say amen. 
So something would be going on. But you know, the reality is that people who don't express themselves, even the matter of song, they might say, well, I just don't sing very well. I'm not a good singer. Or they might say, well, it's just my temperament. I'm just too reserved. My father was military. My father had every right to be reserved. I never heard my father shout one day in his life, but I've heard him say amen. You know, that may be that you might be reserved, but if you don't take at least an attempt at praising Jesus in the church, odds are you get outside of this church and you'll consistently not praise him there either. Amen. If Jesus came riding down your street, if it's pride standing in the way of praising him, would you be willing to lay down your pride to thank the Lord? Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's just fear. Perhaps fear at times stands in the way of praising the Lord. The classic example that I thought of this week is I was thinking about the matter of praise of somebody who had the opportunity to put a good word in for Jesus, but he was just too scared to do so was Peter. You remember the story? It was after Jesus had been arrested and Peter sort of lurked behind uh, in the shadows to see what was going to happen. Somebody said to him, you're with that Nazarene Jesus, weren't you? What a perfect opportunity. Think about it. A perfect opportunity for Peter to have said, I sure was. And let me tell you all about him. I saw him heal a deaf man. I saw him cause a blind man to see. I saw him make a crippled man walk. And one time I saw him stand up in a boat and shouted at the storm and the wind died down. I sure was. I saw him walk on the water. And I even had been there when people... Uh, were, died and he brought him back to life. I was there just last week and I saw him take a guy named Lazarus and call him out just by name and he walked out still with the grave clothes on. Jesus is innocent. He's the son of God. Yes, I follow him and I'm proud to call him my Lord. Amen. Perfect opportunity. But of course, Peter didn't say a word. He said, I don't know. What are you talking about? I don't know him. And the, the third time, he did that two more times. The third time, he even reached down in his bag of sailor words and cursed and said, I don't know him. How many of us do that? Oh, you might not curse, but you reach down and you fall into fear when people say, hey, you're a Christian, aren't you? Peter didn't take the opportunity. You know, sometimes it's scary to praise Jesus. We don't know what people around us are going to really think about us if they found out we were in church on Sunday and we sang in the choir or we sang in the congregation or we said, amen. So many times we just kind of, we don't say it out loud. We don't want anybody to know that we've got emotions or feelings. Fear keeps us from praising the Lord. Sometimes it's doubt. Doubt. It could be that doubt is hindering your ability to praise the Lord. When I was in Tocoa, Georgia, pastoring there, I was finishing up a stint with Bible League International, representing them through the East Coast. And they sent me on a trip to Latin America. And as I was in Mexico and Latin America, uh, it was being held by the director of Latin American Missions for Bible League, and he, as we were getting together uh, as a group, he began to tell us something that he knew of Latin America. He was from the southern countries. And he began to talk to us about the bullfighting. I thought that was interesting. I thought I knew everything. But as he began to tell us about it, they began, he began to tell us exactly what went on. And you know what? They killed the bulls. They kill the bulls. And he told us about the arena and the color and the fanfare and the crowds that were watching. And a man in a red cape would be jumping around as the bull would charge him. And with every pass, he would take and thrust a lance or a sword into the, into the bull. Even though everybody uh, was cheering and they were going wild, I honestly don't believe watching a bull be killed 
would cause me to want to lift my voice. Maybe some of you have a similar feeling when you're surrounded by people who are praising Jesus. You came and somebody shouts or raises their hand or thanks the Lord or sings out loud and you just stand there wishing it was all over with. You might think, well, you know, I know a lot of others that are really like this. I, I'm just not sure that I should be applauding. I'm sure, just not sure I should be thanking the Lord out loud. I have some serious questions that need to get answered before I could ever praise. It's tough to praise when you have doubts, when you're not sure that you're saved, when you're not sure that you're right with God. It's hard to praise the Lord. Amen. I think about a novel that I once heard about. Several years ago, the novel was entitled The Flight of Peter Fromm, F-R-O-M-M. -M. Peter Fromm was a young man from Midwestern roots. He wanted to be a minister. A high-minded idealism that he, as a Christian, finally enrolled in the University of Chicago Divinity School. And he faced the challenge of a liberal theology being taught by the professors there that didn't believe in the faith. Uh, uh, they lost their faith in miracles. They lost their faith in the inspiration of the scriptures. They lost their faith in the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, they were indifferent about whether Jesus was really the Son of God. Well, the, the book that I was hearing about chronicled how day after day Peter Fromm sat through those classes and he was going to make a difference in that school by sharing with them his faith and by telling them why, why the faith was real and why the miracles were real. But day after day he sat in the classrooms as his, his faith was being torn apart by so-called professors. To the point when he came out of school, he didn't really know what he believed. At the end of the book, he stood before his church in Chicago on Easter Sunday morning to preach a sermon. No longer sure if he really believed in the resurrection, he stood there to preach about the resurrection that Sunday. And as he tried to tell the congregation about the wonder of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, something that he was no longer sure of himself, the inner battle between what he believed and what he was saying overcame him, and he had a nervous breakdown in the, in the pulpit that Sunday, and the people of the congregation had to carry him out. See, that's an extreme case, but it just goes to show you that doubts can really get in the way of praising the Lord. If you're not sure what you believe, if you're not positive that Jesus has saved you, if you're not for sure that Christ rose from the dead, how are you going to praise him? Amen. You have doubts. I know this is a tough one. But if Jesus came riding down your street, and if it was doubt that was standing in the way of your ability to praise him, what would you do? What would you do? Would you be willing at least to lay down your doubts? before the Lord. If you are willing, I'm certain that he'll help you with those doubts Amen. and let you know. There are many other ways that I found this week that that these things are so. The uh, Possessions, sometimes we have possessions that stand in our way or sin or sadness or burdens or worry. I mean, there's a list of things that keep us from praising the Lord. But whatever it is, would you be willing to lay it down at the feet of Jesus if he came down your street today? You're probably here today because you know that where Jesus is going uh, is better than where you are now. You might be here today because what he's offering is much better than what you have now. And what he is asking of you is, is better than the agenda that you have set for your life because that's doing nothing but causing problems. So why not praise him? Amen. Why not praise him? At church, sing, clap, raise your hands, close your eyes, bow your head, and but don't confuse your temperament with praise. At home. What can you do? Whisper a song to Jesus. Well, just think of what your kids would do if all of a sudden you broke out in song, loud as you could sing, 
My wife will do that sometimes. Like she sound like Sandy Patty. <laughs> Just sing. The kids might fall down. They might know what might think you're having a stroke or something. They don't know what's going on. Praise him in your house. Begin every prayer that you pray with praise. Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I was reading the book of Psalms this week, and I came across Psalm 150. Read it when you get home. He said in Psalm 150, verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Unless you have a bad temperament. Unless you're just a shy person. No. Praise Ye, the Lord. If things that had breath ever stopped praising the Lord, what would happen? The rocks would cry out. Because Jesus, the King, is worthy to be praised. When I consider the story of the first Palm Sunday, I was struck by the thought that a coat might not have been worth very much after a donkey walked over it in the street. Now, I want you to remember, these are poor people. These are people with very little to their name. But they took their coats, put it on the road, letting a donkey walk over it, maybe in the mud and the sand. Might not have been wearable after the donkey and everybody treaded underfoot. These people, very poor, they laid their coats, probably the only thing they possessed, they laid their coats down. They laid tree branches down from palm trees just to praise Jesus as he came down on that road. For the people on Palm Sunday, praising Jesus might have cost them something. You see my point? It might have cost them the only thing they possessed, a coat, whatever it might be. It might have cost them something. That sounds a little bit like a sacrifice to me. How about you? The reason I say that is because the Bible speaks of the sacrifice of praise. Yep. The sacrifice of praise. Fitting, isn't it? For somebody who saved our life by sacrificing his own life on the cross. That we might praise him today. And thank the Lord for salvation. For provision for eternity, for his ever, never ceasing praise, uh, presence. We ought to praise him and give it by sacrifice. Doesn't cost you anything to say something. Doesn't cost you anything to try to sing. It doesn't cost you anything to put offerings in the plate. Your tithes, which God demands. It doesn't cost you anything to speak up at the job or in the school. Or before people who don't even know that you're a Christian. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Shall we stand? Lord, we thank you for what we've learned here today. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity that we have to learn once again. That if we don't praise the Lord, then the rocks will cry out. The universe will speak up. Your name demands that we praise. And so, Lord, I pray that today will be the day we begin by life and by lip to praise the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.